Hi, welcome to Cross Community Church. We want to invite you to worship with us Sundays at 8 a.m. in Palm Beach Shores or at 10 a.m. in Palm Beach Gardens. You can find out more about our church and our ministries at crosscommunity.cc.
standing on Jesus Christ, would you give him a big clap of praise? My name is Cody, and I want to welcome you to Cross Community Church. If you are joining us for the first time, we are so glad you are here. Can we please give all of our guests a big welcome? If you are new, we would love to get to know you, so please fill out an in-touch card. You can find this in the seat back pocket in front of you. Fill that out. Hold on to that until after service, and you can either drop that off at our giving boxes in the back or in the foyer at the welcome desk for a free gift. For our local missions focus during the month of January, we are highlighting our partnership with First Care Women's Clinics. First Care offers support for women who find themselves in an unplanned pregnancy while sharing the love of Jesus. Please lift up First Care in your prayers and the work that they are doing in our community. Our annual church bonfire is happening this Friday. Everyone say this Friday. (laughs) January the 19th at 6 p.m. We will enjoy hot dogs, s'mores, and fellowship together. So please bring your own chairs, blankets, and roasting sticks, and we will provide all of the food. It's going to be a great fellowship. Finally, two weeks from today, we will be hosting Dr. R.T. Kendall. Dr. Kendall is a well-known speaker, and we have welcomed him here to our church family multiple times. He's also the former pastor of the Westminster Chapel. So please invite your friends and family and come and join us on this special day. And I did hear that he actually will have his wife with him this time, which is, that'll be awesome, right? Um, Those are all the special announcements for today. So now let's continue in worship for our scripture reading and in prayer. Good morning, church family. Praise God. Hallelujah. Will you stand with me this morning for our monthly Bible verse? This comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, very familiar portion of Scripture. Let's say it together. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Aren't you glad you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior this morning? Hallelujah. Give him a hand clap of praise. Yes. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, please do not leave church this morning without accepting Christ into your life. See me. See one of the pastors. We will, we will guide and, and you through that well. So, And you can become a new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen? Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father, for what Christ did at the cross for us, Lord. We should know, Father God, as believers, that we rely upon the blood of Jesus. We thank you, Father, for salvation. We thank you for a sanctified life this morning, Father. And I pray for anyone who does not know you in this church this morning that they accept you into their lives this morning. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace upon us. I pray over this church right now in the name of Jesus. I pray over our state. I pray over our missionaries this morning, Father, in 2024. Lord, I pray for this country this morning as well. Have your hand upon it, Lord. And we love you and we praise you. As we transition into the remaining part of our service, we ask the Holy Spirit come and minister to us through praise and worship and the reading of your word in the book of Psalms. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Lift your hands, offer yourself to him this morning.
cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree His body bowed and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah stood and all alone. I awoke this morning and was preparing for the 8 a.m. service, and there was literally a deluge occurring at my home, and I had to remember that the Lord promised He would never destroy the earth again by flood. I am glad that you've chosen to be with us today. The late Dr. Charles Stanley one time said that God's Word is an immovable anchor in the time of a storm. 
I had no idea that this morning we would be dealing with a literal physical storm. But I want you to know that God's Word is an immovable anchor during the storms of life. And this morning, I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Psalm, Psalm chapter 1, as we continue this series entitled, New Year, New Start. And this morning, as we make a path toward progress, I want to remind you that there is no way to make a progression toward the right path apart from finding and following the will of God. And the will of God is contained in the Word of God. In the 16th century, there was a man by the name of Martin Luther. The more I get to know about him, the more I read about him, the more I am reminded that God uses imperfect people. Can I get a witness this morning? You're here today because he's been gracious to you. I'm here today because he's been merciful to me. He sustains us. He's gracious to us. And he keeps on working in our life in spite of us. And Martin Luther was that kind of a man. And he was the man that got tired of the false teachings that were occurring in Central Europe in the 16th century. And he was tired of people believing that they could buy their way out of this perceived doctrine known as purgatory. And so on October the 31st, 1517, he nailed onto the castle door of Wittenberg his 95 theses. And in that 95 theses was his repudiation of teaching contrary to the Bible. And Martin Luther was moved by the Word of God. In fact, Martin Luther said this, My conscience has been captivated by the Word of God. And this morning, I believe that's what the psalmist wants us to understand from Psalms chapter 1. Because in Psalms chapter 1, the psalmist reminds us of the explicit imperative nature of God's Word. And in Psalm chapter 1, we are reminded of how important it is to think about how we live our life. Some of us use different kinds of litmus tests to determine whether or not we're living a life for the glory of God. The self-righteous always look at other people's sins, and they say, well, I'm not as bad as that person, therefore I must be okay in the sight of God. What we ought to do is we ought to measure our life against the backdrop of the inerrant, infallible Word of God. I can't remember if this quote belonged to this man in particularly, but it seems like somewhere I read that Socrates once said, an unexamined life is not really a life worth living. I'm not endorsing him at all. I'm simply saying we need to reflect on our life and we need to examine ourselves and we need to look at our life in light of the Word of God. And in Psalm chapter 1, Whoever this author was, this author was inspired by the Holy Spirit to pen these words. And he wrote some of the most incredible steps toward progress. You want to think about a new start for a new year. We ought to think about how we can start out fresh with God based on the authority of his word. In Psalm chapter 1, we read these words, Blessed is the man, could be translated happy, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffer. But his delight is on the law of the Lord, and on the Lord meditates both day and night. He is like a tree that is planted by streams of water, that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked they are not so." But they are like the shaft which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. In this text that I just read to you, the psalmist gives us a series of steps that we should take in our path to progress, in our attempt to have a new start for a new year. And I want to encourage all of you today to listen to the Word of God. And I want to encourage all of you today to ask the Lord to do a work in your heart as I have asked the Lord to do a work in my heart. 
I want us to leave here today with an understanding that God welcomes us into his presence. I want us to leave here with an understanding that God delights in us and that he desires that we follow him, that we walk in his ways. He desires that we know him, that we serve him, that we honor him, that we love him, not for his own good, but for our own good. If we say that we know the Lord, we ought to live in a way that reflects that relationship. And in this psalm, we are told the following. First, we're told this, that we need to start out in the right direction. And that right direction is with God. And how do we do that? Well, according to this psalm, it's very, very clear. The psalmist says that blessed is the man who does certain things and who does not do certain things. You know, when I read this text and I was trying to understand the flow of the passage, I am reminded that the writer of Psalm 1 starts out with a negative statement. A lot of us don't like to think in terms of negativity. After all, we're supposed to be thinkers of positivity. We're supposed to shun any type of negativity, and we should always be positive. Well, the writer starts out on a negative tone, and he says, Blessed is the man who does not do certain things. First of all, the text says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Blessed is the man who does not stand in the way of sinners. And blessed is the man who does not see it set in the seat of scoffers. We could put it this way. The psalmist is telling us in practical terms that we need to be very, very careful with whom we identify. We need to be very, very careful with whom we associate. And we need to be very, very careful with, with what we participate. We're watching right now an epidemic backsliding in the American culture. We're witnessing on a level like a tsunami. It's, it's as if the floodgates have totally opened up. And what I observe in our culture is that our culture is experiencing seismic shifts of ungodliness and seismic shifts of lawlessness and seismic shifts of people who are simply just rejecting every clear principle in the Bible. Now, the psalmist says that the man who is happy or the woman who is happy or the woman who is blessed or the man who is blessed is the person who does not identify with the ways of the world. Blessed is the man or a woman who does not associate with the ways of the world. And blessed is the man or woman who does not participate in the ways of the world. Now, this is not telling us that we are to embrace some type of monastic type of Christianity or some type of isolation where we never engage the world at all. That is not what the psalmist is indicating in this text. The psalmist is simply saying that if you want to be blessed, if you want to know God, there are certain things that you are not going to do. There are certain things that are not going to be characteristic of your life. What are they? Well, anything that you identify with that is ungodly. Anything that you associate with that is ungodly. Anything that you participate in that is ungodly. Those are not the words of a man. Those are the words of the inspired Bible. I find something that is occurring today in the Western Christian Church, and you don't have to be a theologian to know this. You don't have to be a biblical scholar. You don't have to be an expert in cultural analysis. You don't have to be a political pundit. You don't have to be an expert in the Constitution. All you need to do is just kind of look up from time to time and be sensible and see what is going on in our world. Now, I'm convinced that from a biblical worldview, things are going to continue down a downward trajectory. Because as the time comes for Jesus' return, the world is going to increase in lawlessness and ungodliness. Jesus made that very clear in Matthew 24, in Mark 14, and Luke 21. If you read the Bible, you understand the trajectory of society. If you read the Bible, you understand 
that even though the world seems to be spiraling out of control, God has the devil on a leash, and he's the one that ultimately is moving culture in the world and history toward a predetermined end. But even so, here we are in the midst of all of this, and all of the lawlessness and all of the ungodliness is beginning to encroach upon the church. Now, I have to believe that when the writer penned these words, the sovereign person of the Holy Spirit who inspired these words would know in every context and in every culture, every person, in every church, in every continent, in every society, in the history of the world, the Holy Spirit knew who would be hearing these words and when they would be hearing them. And the Holy Spirit has a way of working through the truth and the inerrancy of Scripture to help us to understand how in the world we're supposed to live. Now, I want to ask you a question this morning. This is a rhetorical question. I'm not asking you to amen me. I'm not asking you to oh my me. I'm not asking you to do anything out loud. I'm just asking you to think about this in light of this text. The text says, Blessed is the man or woman who does not walk, who does not stand, and who does not sit in the counsel of the ungodly, the way or the wicked, or the seat of the scornful. Let me ask you a question this morning. Who's giving you counsel? Who are you taking your cues from? Who's advising you? Where are you getting your sense of direction from? I find that oftentimes, because human flesh wants to have our own way, we tend to go by feelings, and we tend to go by what we think. And we tend to draw up all of our conceptions about who God is and what we want God to be, and therefore we live according to those values. I can't tell you who came up with this, but I heard recently two of the greatest mistakes that we can make in life is A, listening to no one, and B, listening to everyone. Be very, very, very careful who you get your cues from. Be very careful who advises you. Be very careful who you identify with, who you associate with, and who you participate with. And this is all the more imperative in the light of the world in which we live. Because some of us this morning, we're walking in a line and in a trajectory that is very difficult because we have loved ones, we have sons and daughters, we have close friends, we have family members, we have children, we have moms and dads who might be embracing the culture. And then we get emotional and we begin to capitulate and we begin to say, well, in this one instance, I can make an exception And I can identify, I can associate, I can participate. I want to suggest to you this morning that God's word is always right, no matter what the emotional pull may be. I'm witnessing today a question on the inerrancy of the Bible. Right now in our own denomination, we're part of the Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee. If you want to know who we are as a denomination, go on our website, read the Declaration of Faith. There are 14 statements. I'm in this denomination not because I believe that we're the only ones, not that I believe that everybody else is wrong. I'm in this denomination because God put me in the denomination, and I believe the denomination in the essence of its teaching is biblical. And the first article in the Declaration of Faith says that we believe in the verbal inspiration of Scripture. Now, you can unpack that, and I could teach for a whole semester on the verbal inspiration of Scripture. But the verbal inspiration of the Scripture essentially says that we believe that the Bible has been inspired by the Lord, by God, and that it is our final arbiter of truth. I am not the arbiter of truth in this church. I occupy the office of pastor, but God can raise anybody up for that role. I approach the role of pastor with a lot of trepidation, a lot of fear, some levels of anxiety, because it's no office to be toyed with. It's not an office to be taken very lightly. But I'm not the authority. The general overseer of this church who oversees over 7 million members is not the final authority. Brothers and sisters, those of you from the Anglican 
or the Catholic tradition, the Pope is not the final authority. I know he speaks ex officio from the Vatican, but he's not the final authority. You're not the final authority. The self-absorbed narcissistic society that we live in today is not the final authority. God's word is the final authority. So a new start, a new year, progressing on the right pathway. We have to make an intentional, volitional, conscience decision what we're going to do, which way we're going to walk. Where is the line growing to be drawn in the sand? I was talking to a pastor the other day who has over 27 years experience in one church. He's 66 years old. He's been doing this a long time. And he said something to me that initially startled me. There's coming a time in the very near future where you're going to have to draw a line in the sand. Where you're going to have to decide where are you going to stand on certain moral issues. Again, I'm not speaking here about becoming some pompous, arrogant fundamentalist. I'm not talking about becoming a moralist. I'm not talking about becoming a legalistic, pharisaical person who is always looking down their nose at someone else. Those of us who want to follow Jesus, those of us who want to follow God's word, we should do it with a great deal of humility and total dependency upon Jesus, recognizing that if he doesn't be gracious to us, our hearts will lead us astray. But God has not left us without direction. He's given us the word. So this morning, the first step is a step in the right direction with the word of God. But there's a second step in this text. The second step tells us that we need to have the right desires for the word of God. In other words, we need to foster that. If you're honest with yourself, none of us desire God like we should. None of us love God like we should. I certainly don't. When I read the Bible, and by the way, I have personally, some people think that I'm bragging when I say these things, I'm not. I've personally made a decision years and years and years and years ago that I have no business preaching the Bible and extrapolating a sermon from the pages of the Bible if I'm not first a student of Scripture for my own personal sanctification and holiness a walk of holiness with God. I have no business getting up on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday or whenever it may be and attempting to preach and teach the Bible when I'm not reading it for personal gain. So I've made a decision to always personally read the Bible. And it's difficult sometimes. I don't always get up in the morning feeling super spiritual. I don't always get up in the morning really wanting to read the Bible and really wanting to pray. I deal with my own sins, I deal with my own setbacks, I deal with my own temptations, I deal with all of that that everybody else deals with, but I've learned a secret. If you're listening, say amen. amen. God gives grace when we humble ourselves before God. Humility does not translate into perfection. None of us in here are going to be perfect on this side of heaven in terms of our behavior. If you're in Christ... God sees the perfection of Christ. He sees you robed in the righteousness of Jesus, and that's the beauty of the gospel. Now, that's a good place to say amen. <laughs> because if you've experienced this, you recognize that you don't deserve it, that you deserve hell, that you deserve the judgment of God, but that on the cross, God placed your sins on Jesus. And when he was looking at the cross, he was looking at you. And now when he looks at us, he sees Jesus. This transformation, this, this transformation that has occurred in the life of a true believer is something that you just have to experience. I can preach about it. I can teach about it. I can talk about it. But until the Holy Spirit quickens you and you respond and you recognize you need Jesus, you will not be born again. Are you born again? I hope so. John, Jesus, in John chapter 3, told Nicodemus, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus was an educated man. I would assume Nicodemus would be, equal, uh, would be equal to a Ph.D. professor. He knew the law. 
And yet Jesus said to him, you're not born again. You must be born again. Nicodemus couldn't get it. He said, how is this going to be? And Jesus said through the work of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes and goes as he wills. John said he's like the wind. You know the wind, the wind is there, but you don't know where he comes from or where he's going. When the Holy Spirit begins to work in the life of an individual, they will desire the Word of God. They may not desire it perfectly, but they will desire the Word of God. We may not desire God perfectly, but we will desire God. There will be something within us that moves us toward God. This is why I tell people, if you have no sense of awakening in your soul toward the things of God, you really do need to understand and check with whether or not you're truly born again. There's no way we can say we know God and we have no disposition. Or as Jonathan Edwards, the greatest theologian that North America has ever produced, a remarkable man, he spoke about the affections, or excuse me, the affections of the human heart having them oriented toward God. And the text says in verse 2 something profound. He's already said, blessed is the man who does not do certain things. Now he says, but that man or that woman delights in the law of God, and on that law he meditates day and night. What's going to happen when you delight in the word of God? Number one, when you delight in the Word of God, you are going to discern God's ways. This is why I'm very concerned with people who always live on their emotions. They're not rooted in a church anywhere. They're not rooted in any kind of a small group. They don't have any kind of accountability in their life. They just go through life thinking that they are autonomous and that they don't need any sense of accountability. They don't need any sense or understanding of the Word of God. And so they go through life instead of discerning, they are deceived. They are deceived because they don't discern God's ways through God's Word. You cannot know God apart from the Bible. And then, when we delight in the Word, not only do we discern God's ways, but we do God's will. Now, I understand that there are some aspects of God's will that may not be initially discernible in the pages of the Bible. For example, you're preparing to marry someone, and you want to know, is this the will of God? Well, the Bible tells us general things about the will of God. The Bible says don't be unequally yoked. So if you're a believer and you love an unbeliever, you don't need to marry that unbeliever. No matter how much you love them, no matter how much you think you're going to change them, don't do that because you're not equally yoked. Now that's the clear will of God. But let's suppose that both of you love Jesus and you're wanting to get married. Is it God's will? Well, the Word of God gives principles, but the Word of God may not tell you specifically who you are to marry. But I will tell you this, when you are delighting in the Word of God, you will discern His will, and you will be able, through the help of the Holy Spirit and the principles in Scripture, to do God's will when you delight. And the text says that when you delight, you're going to meditate. It's an interesting use of a word, isn't it? I'm certainly not an expert in the Hebrew language, but I can tell you this word, what it does not mean. This word does not mean the transcendental meditation that has so permeated the North American Western culture. That is an Eastern mystic form of conscientious reorientation. And the Bible tells us that we are to meditate on the Word of God, which means it's more than reading, it means that we're studying and that we're thinking about what we're reading and the implications of what we're reading. And when we truly read the Bible, we will truly understand the Word of God and the will of God, and we'll discern the direction of God as we meditate on the Bible. So I want to suggest to you this year, for those of you who are interested in progressing on the right path, for those of you who are interested in taking a new start in the new year, I want to suggest to you 
that when you read your Bible, you do so with a pen in hand or whatever mechanism or method you use to take notes, and that you read your Bible carefully and that you take copious notes and you ask lots of questions and you seek answers so that you are thinking about and meditating on the Word of God. If we would meditate on the Word of God and understand the Word of God, I am convinced that we would not embrace some of the seduction of our society that is encroaching on every aspect of the family and every aspect of the church. It's there, and it's not going away. I was in a conversation the other day with a group of pastors, and I gave them my opinion on what we're watching in the world. You can disagree. I'm not saying I'm right. I think I have a good reason for making this case, but I want to suggest to you that what we're watching in the world today with the sexual revolution is not like the sexual revolution that some of you lived through in the 60s. That was before my time. But I've studied about that decade. I understand what was going on and why it was so conspicuous and so pervasive in our society. And of course, every decade has its characteristics, doesn't it? I mean, every decade has its defining characteristics that bring meaning to that generation. But there's something going on today that is not a trend or a fad. Trends and fads come and they go. Philosophical ideologies stay. They remain. They get embedded into the fabric of society, and they become such a deep part of the way people think and the way people leave that, live that they do not go away. And that's where we are right now with what we're witnessing in the world today. We're literally watching an ideological philosophy that is taking over every sphere of society. If I had time, I could prove this to you. But suffice it to say, it's taking over the political arena to where today, identity politics is not just something we talk about, it is a reality. Political platforms today are characterized by certain moral platforms. There's no way of differentiating between the two. It's taking over the educational system. Have you been watching what's been going on with Harvard and Penn State? Have you been watching these professors? These, these women are bright women. They have earned PhDs. I know this. I've been there. To earn these things, you've got to write. You've got to be able to think. You've got to be able to conceptualize frameworks of ideas. And yet, to hear them testifying on Capitol Hill, you wonder if they even got through middle school. I don't understand this, but then again, I do understand it. I understand it because the ideological philosophy that's driving their worldview. And brothers and sisters, not only is it swept through the political system and the educational system, it's sweeping through the church at a dizzying speed, so much so that I have a pastor friend of mine. I'm going to leave his name and church anonymous, but recently he called out a professor in a well-known institution because this professor went to a gay-affirming church and received communion. And this pastor says, this cannot be in our movement. We will not allow this. We will not permit that kind of a professor to infiltrate the minds of our children when they go to the university. I stand against this. And the moment he stood against it, the professor filed charges of defamation. I stand with that pastor. He's right and the professor is wrong. According to the Bible, you cannot affirm and associate with the LGBTQ agenda. And I know it's going to bring division in the church. I know it's going to bring division in the church. But here we stand, our conscience, are captive to the Word of God. We don't hate. We don't discriminate. We love unconditionally. But we stand fervently on the Word of God because the Word of God is always right. 
And this text tells us that we are to delight in the Word of God. And then the text tells us something else, that we are to know the right description of the Christian life. Do you understand what it means to be a Christian? It doesn't mean to walk around and be a morally upright person, even though that is a product of Christianity. To be a Christian means that you have placed your eternal hope in the person of Jesus Christ, not Jesus plus something else, Christ and Christ alone. Being a Christian does not mean you're always going to be happy. Being a Christian does not mean you're always going to be joyful. Being a Christian does not mean you're going to get a promotion, doesn't mean you're going to be rich, doesn't mean you're never going to go through a divorce, never means you're going to get cancer, doesn't mean you're always going to get into the university, doesn't mean any of that. But let me tell you what it does mean, because according to this text, the Bible says this about the person who delights in the Word of God. Notice what the text says. He's like a tree that is planted by the streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and his leaf does not wither, and all that he does, he prospers. Now, that's not a text indicating that we will always be healthy, wealthy, and wise. But what it does mean is this, that when we turn to the Lord, our life is characterized by permanence, our life is characterized by progress, and our life is characterized by productivity. In other words, we should be moving toward being fully devoted followers of Jesus, and we should be bearing some level of fruit. If we don't read the Bible, we will not have one iota of an idea of what it means to be a Christian. Let me tell you what will happen. If you don't read the Bible, if you don't delight in the Word of God, you will become a cultural Christian at best, but you will not be a Christ-like Christian. And there is a vast sea between the two. In fact, I want to suggest to you that the two are mutually exclusive. Being a cultural Christian is the same thing as being a cultural Muslim or a cultural Buddhist. It means nothing other than some type of cultural identification badge or some kind of a family honor badge. If you're a Christian, if you believe in Jesus and you're following the Word of God, It is going to change your life. It might be incremental changes, but it's going to change your life. And you're going to be like this tree that's planted by the rivers of living water. And you're going to bear fruit. And you're going to progress. And you're going to understand what it means to be productive. This is what it means to understand a Christian description of a believer. Get into your Bible in 2024. Don't let anything hinder you from reading and studying the Bible. And then the text tells us something else. Now, we're talking here about new steps for a new year. We're talking about making progress on the path of progression. Not progressiveness in the sense of our secular society, but progression in the sense of progressing in our understanding of Jesus' lordship in our life. The text tells us not only are we going to know the right direction, not only are we going to have the right desires, not only are we going to understand a description of the Christian life, but when we delight in the Bible and we delight ourselves in the Word of God, we're going to understand the destination of humanity. We're going to understand the final destiny of humanity. And I'm talking here about a biblical worldview I believe you want to know what a biblical worldview is. After all, you are here today. You came to church today. This morning when I was driving to the 8 a.m. service, I said to myself, well, I guess we'll be preaching to about two people today and uh, because it was flooding. The service was packed out. It was unbelievable how many people came out to the 8 a.m. service. And we sat under the word of God together and we listened to this text. And I told them the same thing I want to tell you. According to a biblical perspective, according to a biblical worldview, we will either go to heaven or we will go to hell. Man, this is culturally offensive. It's counterintuitive. It's something that we would rather not talk about, but 
the text talks about it, so we have to wrestle with it. What does this mean? He starts out by saying, blessed is the man who does not walk and sit and associate, but delights in the word of God, and he's going to bear fruit, but the ungodly are not so, but they're like the shaft, that unproductive part of a piece of grain that is just blown away in the wind, it's useless, or we're going to be like the righteous that is known by God, or we're going to be like the wicked who, whose way is going to perish. So here's what the Bible says. We can either prosper or we can perish. <laughs> this is pretty significant language. You say, I don't know about this. I don't know if I really want to anchor my faith and my destiny and my worldview in such offensive, strong language. Yesterday, I read an article. I wasn't planning on reading it. I just came across it. I read everything I can get my hands on. And it was an article written about the Hollywood elites who have rejected Christ and the gospel and who are now atheists. And because it's in writing, because it's there for the world to see, I can quote it and refer to it without defaming anyone because defamation means that you're speaking untruths. But if you're simply reporting on what is true, you're not defaming anyone. But you have people like Brad Pitt and George Clooney. You have some of the most prominent movie stars like Angelina Jolie who've said now that they know what is right and what is true and therefore God does not exist. And what happens is people look to them whether they're rich and they're famous and they're good looking and they're, and they're popular and the whole world is watching them and they're famous and I want to be like them so I'm going to be an atheist. I'm just going to reject everything that the Bible teaches about God and the gospel, heaven and hell and forgiveness and atonement, and I'm going to go by the way of the world and I'm just going to em embrace atheism because there's only two views in the world. There's secularism or atheism, same thing, or there's Christianity, a biblical Christianity. There's various branches, but there's one of the two. And here's what happens. I've seen this over and over and over again. If you're listening, say Amen. People start dialoguing about the Bible. They get confused about the Bible, and instead of submitting to it out of humility, they start debating the Bible. And then when people want to start debating every nuance of Scripture, they're going down this slippery slope of being backslidden. I'm not talking about seeking out the truth. I'm not talking about reasoning. I'm not talking about being objectively astute with the mind God's given us. I'm not talking about that. But when we begin to debate this stuff to the point, then we begin to deny it. And then when we begin to deny it, we begin to walk in this ongoing process of denouncing the Word of God. And when we do that, brothers and sisters, this text tells us we defy it and then we're subjected to utter destruction. You say, boy, that sounds strong. Well, that's the way the psalm ends. This is what the Bible says. But God says, I would rather you experience prosperity, spiritual prosperity, rather than perishing. So there's two ways to be saved. Either you can be good enough, as good as God. <laughs> I'm shot, and so are you. Or you can have God give you the goodness of Jesus. That's what happens when you're born again. And you, you receive this goodness, and then you embrace the Word of God, and you live for Him. You trust Him. You put your hand in the hands of Jesus, and you follow Him all the way into heaven. I'm going to ask you to stand, and I'm going to ask you right here and right now, right where you're sitting, to settle something between you and God. 
you say, well, Pastor, God isn't dealing with me about this. Settle it anyway. Right now, between you and God, I'm going to ask you, in your own way, to humble yourself before the Lord and to say to Jesus right now, to the best of my ability, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to delight in you. And to the best of my ability, no matter what you ask me to do, no matter which direction you tell me to go, I'm going to follow you.